So I, I want to welcome everyone. Um, we're very happy to be here. I'm Manal Omar. I'm the Acting Vice President for the Middle East and Africa Center. Uh, and I welcome you to the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, we're very excited to be having this discussion with uh, IOM, um, the International Organization for Migration. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we also partnered with IOM, and I think that the discussion was very rich and very helpful, so we're looking forward to this again. Um, we're hoping um, initially to have a public event, but because of the weather and because of other um, limitations, we weren't able to, especially over the holidays. Um, so we're glad that this worked out. We're also um, filming and going to push out the video to a much wider audience, um, so I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of that. Um, as most of you know, I think you guys are familiar with the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, Iraq was our first country office. It was our first presence in the field. Um, we've been there since 2003, and we've always been very proud to say that we've never pulled out of Iraq. And particularly at times when people were, for very legitimate reasons, being forced up to the north or having to go out to neighboring countries, USIP has always maintained a presence in Baghdad and in other areas. <coughs> Um, and we found that has always allowed us to really strengthen our relationships with our partners, including the government of Iraq. Um, today we have three distinguished speakers who are going to talk about the work from, um, from Iraq, particularly from a field perspective, being on the ground. Um, we have Dr. Thomas Weiss, who's going to be our first speaker. He's the chief of mission of, for IOM in Iraq. Welcome to USAID. Thank you so much, Manal. Um, we're also very lucky to have Dr. Eli Abouan, who's the director of our Middle East programs. Um, he's based in the field in Beirut, and he was actually in Iraq in December and travels all across the region. Um, and we also have our senior program officer, Sarhan Hamasid, who's also our lead on all Iraq programs, who was also in Iraq in December. So really the focus that we're looking at is kind of inside Iraq, how is the programming um, developing, and the political situation. Um, the difficulty of Iraq has always been that the changing situation makes us a little bit lagging, us being the international community, often lagging and really being able to identify the trends and the patterns that are happening in Iraq. What we're hoping is through this discussion, we can be a little bit forward leaning and identify the trends rather than having to react to them. So that will be the primary focus of um, the conversation with a specific uh, look into the security and political conditions efforts to counter the Islamic State. We're seeing a growing militarization of the society, the difficulty in terms of programming gaps, as well as the challenges that lie ahead. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and actually turn over to the field and starting with Dr. Weiss, um, hear a few um, comments, and then we'll to move to the other panelists. Dr. Weiss. Thank you very much, Manal. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, very happy to be here to share this, this space together with you. Um, I'd like to start, of course, by thanking very officially the U.S. Institute uh, um, of Peace for the great work that you're doing. Congratulations to your consistently uh, very important efforts when it comes to preventing and mitigating conflict. I think this is a very, very laudable uh, work that needs to be made known, that needs to be supported. Uh, from all possible quarters, and we are certainly, as International Organization for Migration, very happy to be making use of this forum of the space that you're offering to us. Uh, I would also like to seize this opportunity to thank my colleague, uh, our Chief of Mission, uh, Luca Dallolio, uh, Chief of Mission of IOM here in Washington, for together with uh, USIP having, having um, arranged for this meeting and having organized this encounter. Um, my presentation, as Manal said, is going to be out of the cuff. I did not really prepare anything formal. Uh, we, we did not want to formalize this presentation through, through PowerPoint, etc., etc., um, but really share with you a perspective from the field. And I am, as Chief of Mission, only one of approximately 600 colleagues that we, as the International Organization for Migration, do have in the field in Iraq, operating uh, out of uh, what we call three regional hubs, Baghdad, Erbil, Basra. We have a support office in Amman in Jordan. And our operations, our colleagues, are basically covering all the 18 administrative units of the country called governorates. So this is sharing with you a little bit of the, of the very field-based, field-driven type of experience that we, uh, as IUM, 
working in Iraq since 2003, over the last 12 years, have been able to, to build up, to construct uh, step by step. Um, I suggest to articulate my, my presentation uh, uh, briefly around, uh, around three particular points, kicking them off with a, like a human interest story, a little, little uh, experience uh, um, that we have had recently um, with some of our beneficiaries. And then to give you some pointers regarding first um, uh, the general situation in Iraq, where we stand from IOM's point of view at the present moment. Then to talk second uh, about uh, what um, I would call free peace, partnership and programmatic priorities, strictly from an IOM point of view. And then to wind it all up, uh, sharing with you some, some rays of hope, something that uh, in spite of everything you can hear and read <coughs> and listen to regarding of Iraq uh, and the, the, the currently prevailing situation, uh, some small indicators that uh, make us as one of the humanitarian players in Iraq believe that there is some modest grounds for optimism. So if you would bear with me with this specific structure, so I would like to kick it off with a small story. And the story goes as follows. At the end of November last year, um, <coughs> we as IUN um, distributed approximately 100 non-food item packages to 98 families living um, accommodated temporarily in a very small village in northern Iraq, uh, right between Duhuk and uh, the border of Syria. So we arrived there with the colleagues and with the, with the, uh, with the lorry uh, containing the, the NFIs. Uh, and then we were surprised, where is the village that the <coughs> displaced persons were supposed to be, to be living at? So there were only a couple of houses standing there. And then we learned that these couple of houses um, were the village that was created, that was established, sometimes uh, between, between the end of the First World War and, and the mid-1920s, jointly by a few families of Christian and of Muslim background. So today, this is a village made up of 20 families, approximately 110 persons, actually. And these 10 families, 110 persons, were welcoming, were accommodating a hundred new families, um, victims of the, of the recent displaced crisis originating from the Sinja mountains. So essentially, families making up, uh, um, or, or made up of, of representatives of the Jazidi community. So we started to talk to, to, to the, well, the Mokta, the, the, the uh, leader, of, of this uh, little village and then his, his counterpart, the, the head of the Christian um, um, uh, community and expressing our surprise. How come that you managed to accommodate, to, uh, to, to welcome so many new people? And they simply said to us, look, it's an issue. If, if we had been the victims of the other Iraqis would have welcomed us. We share the little resources that we have. They receive uh, each and every day from the municipality in Duhuk. Uh, there's a small lorry coming in with bread and with, with, uh, with food items, other food items, and then we share, then we share. And I believe it's, it's good to kick off a presentation about Iraq with this extraordinary example of generosity and hospitality with this extraordinary example of humanity. Because, let's face it, when we open the newspaper and we read news about Iraq, we certainly do not associate whomsoever and whatsoever in Iraq with characteristics of generosity, hospitality, <coughs> and humanity. And I'm going to get back to this point in my last of the three points in terms of the race of hope. So, um, the general situation in the country is, is indeed dire. 
it's very difficult. We are now <coughs> with the greatest and the biggest displacement crisis in the already very long and very often very tragic history of the country. Um, to share a few numbers, a few numbers with you. There's an agreement among representatives of the new government and the international community, the United Nations, that um, at the present moment, there are more than 5.5 million persons in Iraq directly affected by the ongoing displacement crisis. More than 5.5 million persons. 2.2 million of these represent the victims of the latest succession of displacement crises that started in early 2014, in, in June 2014, during <coughs> what we call the, the Mosul crisis. This Mosul crisis was uh, directly afterwards followed by um, an Anbar crisis, by a Sinjar crisis, and the succession of crises in the country last year, uh, approximately early November, mid-November, was then finished by another, another Anbar crisis and displacement related to smaller focus areas of, of crisis, basically. So altogether, we are now talking about 2.2 fresh victims of displacement due to the ongoing fights in the country. Then we have to add and nobody knows exactly, another 500,000 to 1.3, 1.4 million victims of a previous displacement crisis, the, protect, the, the protracted victims, basically. Then we have approximately 230,000 Syrian refugees, victims of the ongoing military operations and the humanitarian crisis in Syria who have opted to cross the border and to become refugees in, in Iraq. Then we have quite a number of Iraqi returnees, returnees from neighboring countries, but also from, from further abroad, approximately 70,000 persons. And then to all of those direct victims of displacement, you have to add host communities, like the 20 families in the small village between Dohuk and the border of Syria who for reasons related to geography, for reasons related to chance, for reasons related to humanity, have been directly affected by the crisis. Directly affected because they are sharing their very scarcely available resources with these internally displaced persons. And this is another group of approximately 1.8 or 2 million um, persons. So altogether we are talking about 5.5, perhaps a bit more, persons directly affected by the crisis um, in, in the country. So this is unprecedented in the long history of, uh, of the country. Um, <coughs> I will not um, go too much into detail when it comes to the, the range of IUM operations that we are implementing uh, in Iraq. Uh, um, we opened our first <coughs> office, as I mentioned earlier, 12 years ago and have always been implementing uh, examples in terms of projects or programs covering the whole spectrum of migration management, technical cooperation, counter-traffic, <coughs> capacity building, uh, movement-related type of operations. We are operating on behalf of the US government, the United States Refugee Resettlement Program in Iraq, which is one of the biggest sending countries for refugees regularly resettled in your country. Uh, but we also have a very important um, part of our operational portfolio occupied by or busy with uh, interventions uh, in the area of uh, humanitarian assistance, life-saving type of operations. Now the ratio of like technical cooperation, capacity building, and the other regular type of migration management activities as compared to interventions in the humanitarian realm has of course been changing with the onset of the fresh series of crises in early 2014. Um, IUM um, is now approximately, well we have at the end of last year we had an operational portfolio of about 120 million US dollars 
80% of this in 2014 was dedicated to life-saving humanitarian response activities. But of course, we hope that at one point of time, this is going to flip over again so as to enable us to focus more on migration management, on longer term type of activities. Um, regarding figures, and with this I'm going to finish my, my first point, uh, we have a very interesting mechanism that we call the displacement tracking matrix in Iraq, and um, which is on behalf of the entire humanitarian assistance community on behalf of the United Nations country team, <coughs> providing all those humanitarian players with basic data, basic information, which is crucially and critically needed in, do, uh, well, in order to do <coughs> proper humanitarian planning. Um, we employ at the present moment 600 colleagues in Iran, most of whom are local staff members and most of whom are directly involved in the operation of the displacement tracking matrix, through which we have, well, we have field-based teams, these field-based teams um, roving around in the 18 governorates uh, to talk directly to victims of displacement, to talk directly to representatives of host communities, like the Mokta or like the, the Christian mayor we spoke to in this little village uh, close, to, close to the hook. Uh, in order to get an idea about numbers of people displaced, about patterns of displacement, whether this is a primary, a secondary, or a tertiary type of, type of displacement. And what are the particular needs? The needs in terms of food, the needs in terms of um, non-food items, and other types of needs of these freshly displaced populations. This information generated through these interviews, direct interviews on the ground, is then channeled uh, or is then sent by our colleagues to the three regional hubs. And the hubs representing the central nervous system of the DTM, of the displacement tracking matrix, is then transforming this information every two weeks into a new set of maps, of statistics, of updated lists of needs. And these lists, these statistics, are then being used by players representing the whole of the international humanitarian response community in order to do their, their proper planning. Um, um, this DTM is an, is an IOM product that we have um, elaborated, that we have launched a couple of years ago, uh, and it's now, it's now um, uh, operational in, in, in all countries where IOM has a presence that is related to providing assistance to um, humanitarian um, uh, and emergency situations, South Sudan, uh, Afghanistan, Haiti, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this in terms of the general, the general situation. My second point is the point related to the free peace, partnership and uh, programmatic priorities. Um, our Director General, um, Ambassador William Lacey Swing, US, uh, US ambassador, um, when he started with his first mandate in 2008 as our DG, um, shared um, a list of <coughs> top priorities with member states, stakeholders, and also his own colleagues in the organization. And on top of this, uh, this list, he had decided to put partnerships, because simply based on the understanding that uh, migration and its management is larger than life an issue. Migration has so many um, issues of interaction. It's so much cross-cutting with development, with gender, with labor, with environment, with health, that it is simply too big in order to be handled properly by only one single player. So if you want to be efficient in working in migration management, you work hand in hand with partners. And Iraq is a fantastic terrain or territory or laboratory for working in partnership on migration management issues and especially on issues related to responding to the humanitarian crisis. Um, I have very little time left. Um, and this partnership that we have with UNHCR, with UNICEF, with many other agencies has also been fomented um, 
underlined very strongly by um, a huge amount of funding that last year, mid of last year, uh, the UN country team received from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia through OCHA. Uh, and we have to report joint to, o to OCHA and to the Kingdom in terms of the use that we made of these funds. Programmatic priorities. Um, because of the situation and because of the, the very difficult definition of what is the priority now, because we are now in winterization and then we have summerization, then we have community stabilization, social cohesion, etc., etc. Um, we work on all of those issues at the same time. When we are asked about what your priorities are, we simply say the priority is to save lives and then to make sure that uh, people are given the necessary means, the necessary elements, in order to um, recreate sustainable livelihoods. And we hope to be able, of course, to continue working on, on, on these different focus areas. And this leads me to my third point, which is the race of hope. Um, together with the government of Iraq, we have been very much encouraged by recent uh, political developments. You all know that the formation of the new <coughs> government following the election last summer was a very, uh, very lengthy, a very thorny process. Uh, now it is, it is done. Uh, there is lucky enough a, a participation uh, on the part of uh, um, representatives representing the different sectarian, the different ethnic groups. Um, and this government has, at the end of uh, last year, um, organized two very important events that I wanted to share with you as two examples of these rays of hope. The government has, for the first time in many years, called for a humanitarian dialogue, humanitarian dialogue with representatives of the international community, representatives of diplomatic missions represented in Baghdad, to talk about what is going on, to talk about the difficult and the dire situation of so many persons in Iraq directly affected by the crisis, and to talk about joint ways in order to address these issues. So this was interpreted by many of the participants representing the international community as a very sound and a very hopeful step into the right direction. And this step has been then been in parallel matched with uh, the first um, interactive session between representatives of the new government and the United Nations country team at the level of heads of agencies. We started the day after this humanitarian dialogue uh, to organize our own bilateral dialogue revolving around four particular issues that were predetermined two of which have a direct bearing on the humanitarian <coughs> situation in the country uh, related to social cohesion as well as sustainable responses to the displacement crisis. So we all believe that this expression of interest on the part of the new Iraqi government to actively dialogue with the UN, with representatives of the international community, with donors is a very positive step going into the right direction. And this is then matched with the example of generosity and uh, hospitality that uh, um, uh, we all have as colleagues working for IUM, as colleagues working for other agencies. Uh, I could give you plenty full of additional examples of this generosity and hospitality. And, and, and therefore we believe that in spite of the currently very difficult, very dire situation that the country is in, there is some ground for optimism. If we continue to all work continuously together in partnership, if we continue to all work continuously together in engaging the government, in making sure that the government is acknowledging responsibility, and if we continue to work together also with the donor community, and we have just uh, today, yesterday, and since the beginning of the week had a number of discussions with representatives of the United States uh, donors, PRM, State Department, uh, USAID, OFTA. If this uh, dialogue also can continue and will be crowned from time to time with fresh funding, I believe that there is an opportunity, a possibility to help Iraq overcome the current crisis situation. So thank you very much again to the US Institute uh, of Peace for this opportunity to, to dialogue with you and of course very much interested in hearing your comments and questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Weiss, and thank you also for ending on a note of optimism. I think it's very difficult when we're looking at the situation in Iraq to peel back a lot of the political elements and be able to see, and I think most people in this room will really sympathize with the idea of our priorities are moving in parallel. It's very hard to put one above, above the other, especially because they're so interlinked. Um, we'll move on to Dr. Ili, who is our Middle East Director. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'll, uh, I'll steer a little bit away from the displacement and the technical <laughs> aspects of displacement and responding to the humanitarian crisis. I throw some ideas to the discussion about radicalization and the increasing <coughs> militarization of the communities, as, uh, as we're trying to call it. Uh, I mean, until, until very recently, everyone was talking about radicalism and radical groups. I think now, if we look at the region, especially the Levant, we should be more concerned about the fast-growing militarization of the communities, not only the communities uh, sorry, not only the militarization of radical groups, but also of communities <coughs> that are not labeled as being radical. Uh, in, in the 90s, I was always offended when I heard about the Lebanization of the Balkans, and then uh, offended also by when I heard about the Balkanization of the Iraq, and then now the Somalization of Syria, and other dramatic analogies. I think that we're set to live with more dramatic analogies, uh, unfortunately, in the coming years. The existence of radical groups in the region is not new. Uh, they've always existed. What is new, nevertheless, is the fact that we've noticed that they are able now to build smaller constituencies from among the local communities around them. And this is the dangerous trend. Uh, Controlling territories and some resources by a radical group is not by itself a dangerous or as dangerous as being able to infiltrate people's hearts and minds uh, in some cases. Uh, that's true, it's slow and limited until now, but if it's not addressed at these stages, then it becomes uh, beyond control. So, uh, w and what worries me also is the fact that we're seeing an increasing uh, hatred speech and discriminatory statements and behaviors uh, in coming from non-Muslim communities as a reaction to the radicalization of some Muslim communities. So it is becoming a worrisome trend in the region and uh, I think it, it has to be addressed somehow. The response so far has been focused on the military and security aspects, aspects which I think is uh, short-sighted, <coughs> with all due respect to the proponents of this strategy, I think that uh, train and equip programs, providing weapons, uh, and other, other uh, military responses to the crisis are, can cover only some aspects, but are not uh, wise and are not sufficient, definitely. Uh, and what we're, seeing, uh, what we're seeing as a result of this strategy is that it is leading uh, to uh, a massive distribution of weapons among people in the region. Uh, and in, in many cases, it's being done v in, in a very chaotic uh, way. Uh, the, the emerging non-state actors with a lot of weapons are now being manipulated by local and regional players. Uh, so we have uh, Shabaks trained by Shias, we have Shabaks trained by uh, Kurdish, by, by Kurds, sorry, we have uh, Christians trained by different parties, we have Yazidis trained by these and Yazidis trained by others. It's, uh, it's a bit worrisome how this will unfold in the coming, uh, in the coming phase. Uh, we are seeing an increased use of violence in non-political uh, conflict. So uh, we're reading more and more about shooting incidents or violence used in uh, tribal slash civilian uh, or conflicts of tribal or civilian nature. We're seeing uh, uh, an increased uh, number of child, uh, children involved in, in the military groups. And we're seeing as well uh, some extravagant and dangerous political agendas being put forward, such as minority leaders, especially minority religious leaders, uh, requesting an international military protection for minorities, for example. I think this is by itself uh, a, a, very, uh, a very dangerous uh, trend that uh, some communities might be taking. 
So today, we uh, the region is living with around 1,000 groups in Syria, 1,000 military groups in Syria. We're uh, Iraq. Uh, we're seeing an increased number of Shia militias. Uh, before we were struggling between Al Sadr and Al Badr. Now we have a lot of new names, a lot of new trends within the Shias themselves. Uh, we are seeing uh, Sunni tribes or Sunni tribal groups being trained by Jordanians, by Qataris, by Saudis. Uh, we're seeing uh, Lebanese Shia from Hezbollah fighting in Syria. We're seeing Iraqi Shias coming from Iraq to fight in Syria. We're seeing Kurds going all through Turkey to fight in Kobani. All these are new trends to the region. And uh, if they are not new trends, they are th the, the scope of these trends at this stage is, is, uh, has become really dangerous. So the focus from my perspective should not, on, should not only be uh, limited to the military and security aspect. We need to look into other aspects uh, as well, including, uh, including education and economic development. Uh, these groups might be defeated militarily, or they might cease to exist at some point when their patrons decide to stop their funding. But the consequences that the events are leaving, the scars they are leaving uh, at, at, at the communal level, uh, are not easily uh, uh, are not easy to handle. Uh, so uh, we are consistently observing a, th a thrive for revenge uh, in Iraq. Uh, and like, even if we uh, we are optimistic and we hope that some regions will be liber liberated in the coming future, the have, seeing the IDPs returning to this region is not uh, is not granted. It's uh, there are a whole set of challenges, including the possibility of seeing revenge uh, operations being carried out by some actors. There is somehow a change in the set of social values. The violence is violence is more accepted nowadays, uh, especially at the, at the level of youngsters. Uh, and we have scores of uh, youngsters who are not able to go to school uh, because of their uh, displacement or status as refugees. Just as uh, a highlight, the offspring of those who started fighting in Iraq in 2003 are today, they, they are 12 years old. In few years, uh, this generation will start fighting itself as their fathers did. So I don't think there is a lot, uh, a lot of time uh, ahead before we look into more comprehensive solutions to, 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 to the trends that I described. Uh, and, and again, uh, I, sincerely call on uh, looking into aspects related to education and economic development in addition to the military response, which I'm not denying the value of, but it shouldn't be the exclusive approach to look into the situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Inley, and I think some of the points you brought up kind of push us to think, I mean, particularly the idea of the difference between rad radicalization and also the militarization of entire communities. It really goes beyond just one particular individual. Um, also kind of bringing out the non-state actors and what the role for us to really think about that. You know, most of our program traditionally is built bilaterally, so what do we do with this emergence of non-state actors? Um, I thought it was important, kind of the note that you kept talking about the region. Um, it's very hard to talk about Iraq now in isolation. Tying it to the region more and more is becoming um, really important, not just because the borders are you know, literally being blurred, but the way the conflicts are actually feeding one, each, one another. Um, I think a lot of us are aware of the pitfalls of the train and equip alone, and you know, I think that cautionary note is very important. Um, but, you know, I think also kind of on the note of optimism is just this realization that we have a lot to do in the prevention mode. It's not just responding to conflict, but we can actually prevent further conflict. And I think the point of the 12-year-olds today compared to 2003 when we started is a very strong way to drive that home. So thank you for those trends. Um, turning to you, Sarah Hung, our uh, lead on Iraq programming. Uh, thank you, Manal. And uh, I'll be talking about uh, nuancing a couple of areas that uh, Dr. Weiss and Dr. Lee mentioned. Uh, uh, first of all, I 
when we were there in December. I'll, I'll add the dimen long dimension, but also tie it to the meetings that we have uh, done in December. Uh, it was uh, the last time I was there in, in, in June. Uh, actually, I, I departed a couple of days before the, the so-called Islamic State takeover of Mosul. At the time, we were looking at Iraq, we were looking about prospects for reconciliation and see uh, what we can do <coughs> on those. And two days after, the, the dynamics completely changed. Uh, but I think some of the long-term issues will remain the same. Uh, before I get uh, to those lo more long-term, just to give you a feel of the change I have seen in just in six months, uh, the calmest elements uh, of the Iraqi society I've, I have seen uh, in my life was uh, the Yazidis and, and the Christians of Iraq. And actually today, probably they are the most angry, uh, and they have the right to be so. Uh, uh, talking about calm, talking about, uh, about tolerance, will trigger more reaction, uh, emotional reaction, uh, from somebody than, uh, and, and talking about revenge and violence and killing and all of that. And that's something that Eli uh, also touched upon. Uh, it was very striking about how in six months uh, so many things have changed in, in people. Uh, and there, are, there were positive things at the macro level, and there were things that uh, worrisome that will give us the indicators for the future. At the, at the national level, I think there was, uh, at the macro level, there was a welcoming <coughs> of uh, the, uh, the steps that uh, <coughs> Prime Minister Abadi is taking. I think there was, uh, it, it was that time we were there that the KRG and uh, Baghdad uh, entered their agreement, so that also injected uh, uh, even more hope that actually the country may be going in a, in a, in a, in a good direction. Uh, so that was good, and everybody, people, Kurds, uh, Sunni, Shia, uh, minorities, all welcome that, that direction. The crackdown uh, on the shadow soldiers uh, and, and many other uh, steps are very, very welcome. The Sunni communities, and this, uh, especially the tribal uh, leaders, are also very welcoming of uh, the, the, the direction that the government is taking. And here, I don't want to lose the, the, the excitement and the point uh, 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 that they are um, uh, expressing. But also, I need to point out that, OK, what is the metric against which they are measuring that excitement? Uh, that excitement is measured against their time uh, and the policies of Prime Minister Malik. Uh, and that, if, if that is the measure, uh, then we'll have to remember, OK, what was the level of uh, frustration and dissatisfaction that were there. So these steps are positive steps in the right direction, uh, great steps, but uh, maintaining them, maintaining the momentum, and tr going beyond just the news and, and, and initiatives to actual practical steps that leads to change in the life of people will be the critical test uh, that the Iraqi government, that the international community uh, should, should uh, maintain an eye uh, on. Uh, the second thing is I'd like to talk about is uh, I think it, it was great after the, the Islamic State took over that there was, okay, wait a second, Iraq exists and there are a lot of problems and it could affect the region, it could be a global problem. Uh, and seeing an international community form and actually the Iraqi politicians come together, the region welcoming the new government and all of that are great positive steps and getting the, paying the attention to Iraq um, it, it is it's very important, and uh, it's very much welcome. But again, in December, uh, it was an opportunity to see more closely uh, where is the gap uh, between where the need is and where the where the help is coming. Uh, I think the magnitude of the of the displacement and those people who are affected is so great and beyond what has been offered uh, by the Iraqi but by the Iraqi government. Uh, by the international community, and also by uh, very generous Iraqis. Actually, before the international community, it was the Iraqis that uh, Dr. Wei spoke about uh, that actually saved the day in so many ways for, so, until the international community acted and set up operations and translated the Saudi money into programs and, and assistance that, uh, that can reach people. But even then, with that, uh, through the meetings that we had, we were told that still the majority of people are not in camps. Those who are in camps, the kind of tents that they have, the kind of assistance they have is not sufficient, is not helping them to cope with the hard, harsh uh, winter uh, of Kurdistan uh, region. So uh, help there, uh, there are other, other issues that may come. Second, 
the, the, the gains against, there has been some gains uh, also on the positive side against the, 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 the advances of the Islamic State. Uh, those gains have been in the Nineveh plains of uh, Iraq, they were in Diyala, uh, they were uh, around Baghdad, they were in Anbar, uh, but also it's important to see the limitations of those gains. Uh, I think by June, July, everybody was hoping, said, okay, this was a shock and a surprise, uh, we will regroup, our people will regroup, and then we'll counter. Uh, but that has not materialized. Uh, and statements like this will take a long time uh, was floating around. But this time in December, what, does that, what was that long time? Uh, I think people start throwing years around, saying, okay, it will take three to five years to liberate Mosul. And these are coming from coalition and non-coalition uh, sources. And if that is the case, then what does that mean? So what three to five years to take what? To push out the Islamic State? If that is the case, and if we are looking at the, uh, the areas that have been liberated so far, what do we see? Uh, uh, we see a lot of destruction. Uh, and to point uh, to what uh, my, uh, the pre previous speaker mentioned, that people go back to what? Reconstituting society and social cohesion around what? When people go back to areas that Zumar have been liberated probably now it's three or almost four months now. Uh, and the clearance of the amount of explosive set and booby traps has not been finished. Uh, parts of and villages around Jalola, which has been also liberated for some time, uh, it ha has not finished. So any liberation will be very much, very slow. And when, it, when you go back, you have large parts of those houses, infrastructure destroyed. So the economic viability uh, in those areas will be really difficult um, and it will be slow. And we don't know the gains that were made in the areas that have been so far, uh, it's, it's to be watched uh, over the long term because these are areas that the Islamic State would have been vulnerable anyway, would not it have been difficult to keep anyways because uh, there were mixed population areas that they did not have a lot of constituency and a lot of support. Uh, whether in, in the Nineveh Plains, where most of the minorities were, or in Diyala, where you have a mix of Shia, Sunni, Kurdish populations. Uh, in Anbar, uh, there were ga more gains in the past three, uh, three, three months, then reversed, some of it reversed, but it's still a major challenge. The true test will be in the Sunni areas, and where are purely Sunni areas. And this is where um, I have seen, we have talked to people who uh, were more welcoming of an Iraqi government uh, and even a Shia army and even sometimes for some of them the level of desperation was even welcoming a Shia militia uh, which uh, they did not accept even in the, for, uh, uh, in the past. That is changing. And then the issue of revenge that we also uh, uh, mentioned, when you go back to this area, uh, even the minorities uh, that we're talking about revenge because their biggest surprise that they say, we know is that the Islamic State was bad, we know what they will do, but our biggest surprise it was when our uh, neighbors, the, the tribal, uh, they, they accused the Sunni tribes of uh, a, a lot of what happened to them. Uh, you, 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 talk, you say the word tolerance in a room and you would have a Yazidi explode and say, how do you, and not point it to him, just word in general. Would, would say, okay, how can I be tolerant with somebody who I raised, who I took to school, who I cared for at the time when uh, he was sick, and was that person who looted my house, who took uh, our women, and is raping our women. So it, it, there are very raw emotions that will take time uh, uh, for healing. And uh, the long term, I think we have a sense now of, it, even if the liberation, uh, physical, military liberation happens uh, quickly, uh, even if it takes another year, then, Speaking of uh, fear, force, and time change people. And this is what is happening uh, in, in, in those areas. Uh, there's a lot of fear against the Islamic State, and there is a lot of force of killing people and forcing their way. And time is on their side now. Uh, and this is what uh, also uh, Ili mentions, that this is where, in addition to the generation who only knew violence, this is where it gives them time to indoctrinate. Uh, in this cycle of violence of 2006-2007, uh, even though there were a lot of violence and there were a lot of ideological issues, but the Iraqi army and the US military kept, uh, kept Al-Qaeda in Iraq on its feet and on the run. This time, they have the luxury of going into Mosul and actually recruiting uh, some 10,000, estimates put it at 10, some 10,000 in Mosul, some another 10,000 in Salah uh, If that, and 
for, for ca the, the training the new Iraqi army, whether after 2003 or uh, in, in this recent round, the m maximum that you can afford probably is a, an eight weeks training and before you send those people to, to fight. If for, and th this is mostly a militaristic fight for the Islamic State, they have much longer time to train jihadists and they are not, they are not quite under pressure in that sense. So uh, giving them another year uh, will create a, dif a different problem, a different animal that uh, we, uh, we, we don't have. So I will tie that to my uh, last point, uh, which is about uh, decentralization in Iraq. I mean, the, 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 before uh, th this recent uh, trend of um, talking about um, uh, reconciliation, different actors coming together, uh, Iraq had a decentralization law that there were efforts to decentralize services and, uh, and, and powers to, to, to the provincial government. And now with, with, with the direction of the violence and the, the governance is going, it, that will be probably accelerated, go more even political, more uh, security. But if we project against that, the layer of the militarization uh, that uh, we're talking, spoken about, is that even if you fight, if you have tribal leaders uh, or militias, they will have a sense of legitimacy that they liberated the land. Uh, after 2003, uh, most of those actors did, could not go to their communities and say that we liberated because the U.S. Army it was the coalition. This time around, those have if they will claim more legitimacy. They will uh, they will be, they will have a more say on uh, how resources will be allocated. Uh, those who did not win in the elections or were stepped aside, uh, they will be seeking uh, retaining a foothold at the local level. So, getting ahead of the next uh, provincial election cycle. Now is the time uh, for that. Uh, when we're talking about uh, militarization for the, for in 2003, and uh, and the Kurds will not be happy to to to, uh, to make this comparison, but uh, I think the co some context uh, is similar. Uh, when the Peshmerga were said, okay, they were the the militias, uh, that was an offending statement uh, to them uh, because they saw them as their liberators and their, as their protectors. For the Shia today. The term uh, militia they may use against certain groups, but they have used the term al hashd al shabi uh, which is a socially mobilized force. Uh, for them, that is protection. That is what prevented the Islamic State uh, from uh, advancing on, on the, the Holy Land. Uh, so their appreciation and their wanting to retain that, the feelings about it is, is, is different uh, from what the international community may feel about or what the Sunnis or what the, 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 the Shia. Are. That will have political uh, implication. And sorry, just on the, on the economic route, uh, the reconciliation and as this division and militarization happening, the barrel of uh, oil at 40 plus dollars is not gonna help. Uh, before, uh, we, we've been hearing about how the Iraqi foreign reserve was wiped out. Uh, Iraq did not pass a budget in 2014. Uh, even when they projected the budget at uh, $60 a barrel, uh, the 2015 budget has a deficit of $35 billion. Uh, now that deficit will even grow. Uh, so fighting, recreating a military, uh, paying for economic reconstruction uh, will have a lot of tension, not only over land and revenge, but also over economic resources. Um, I'll stop here and I'll come back to what the international community uh, come up in, in, the, uh, in this question. Great, Th thank you, Sir Hung. Um, again, very useful and I think particularly just reminding us, how, again, how Iraq is shifting um, in the last six months, the, the viewpoints. Um, but, you know, I think it was also helpful to think about the benchmarks or the metrics that people are comparing to compared to the Maliki. Um, but I think really going, kind of feeding it back to full circle to Dr. Weiss's uh, presentation on the numbers, the staggering numbers that have only begun to increase in terms of displacement and the, added, the idea that no matter what, we're really kind of behind when it comes to the magnitude of what's happening on the ground and that need for the coordination that you were speaking about. I think one of the other challenges, as Sarhang pointed out, is when we're talking about this numbers, you're, we're talking about urban refugees, not the traditional refugees, which most of our programming um, in the past has always been designed for. So how do you identify, how do you prepare, and how do you work with them? Um, all very good points. I thank the panelists. With your permission, what I would like to do <coughs> is um, open the floor for questions and answers. Um, I think it would probably be good to take three at a time. We only have about 20 minutes, so I want to make sure that your questions are um, 
fed into the panelists. So we'll do three at a time, a response, and then if we have time, take another three. I have like 10 questions, so if you don't raise your hands, I'm going to jump in. <laughs> Who would like to ask a question or, or comment? Yay, me. Good. <laughs> Um, one of the questions that I wanted to talk about, you know, there seemed to be a current theme about revenge. Um, in the past, there was um, a lot of conversations around reconciliation. Is there any appetite, and I know, Sarah Hong, you already flagged that the resistance to the kind of um, tolerance in those conversations, but without using the word reconciliation, is there an acknowledgement or are there conversations happening on the ground that that is going to be one of the primary um, issues that will have to happen? I think particularly with your question of back to what, um, and I think the only way of really defining that is, is to understand that line between revenge and reconciliation. I can uh, uh, start with that. Um, I mean, reconciliation um, has different dimensions, and uh, uh, there, there's a national level uh, for many for many actors. Uh, it was before the elections. It was you had uh, Alawi, Maliki, Barzani, and others uh, out of the government, uh, not or or not wor uh, working with each other, or not speaking with each other. Now they are all part of the government. They have senior positions, so that is inclusive. That is, uh, that's the direction that is going to work. Uh, that is, uh, uh, I think, that does not capture the reality because it is not about having people in senior posts. It's about the performance. It's the function of the state and the, the, the situation of the people's life. For that, um, there are efforts that people are focusing on legislation and. Uh, thinking about, okay, what, who do we have uh, in the government? Uh, there isn't serious effort. I mean, at the national level, there is still, uh, for six or seven months now, uh, there isn't, uh, on one side, you can hear that uh, Vice President Alawi is going to lead the national uh, reconciliation effort. You know, it's needed, he's gonna lead it. And then you will come across senior officials who would say, well, no, not quite, we, not official, not final. Uh, that, that, that who runs, who, 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 who takes ownership of this and gonna do it uh, is not settled yet. Um, uh, you have the prime minister who has a senior advisor on this and uh, I think is working on that uh, through some initiatives, you have others, but it has not quite come through a framework that and explains what is reconciliation. What do we mean by that? What do we need? That explanation has not happened, uh, let alone, okay, who is do what about it? At, what has changed in the past six months is that reconciliation probably six months ago was needed uh, as, at the uh, national level between the pol national political actors to get the government going or between uh, the Sunni and Shia general political direction. But now with the amount of uh, feeling of anger and need of revenge, reconciliation will need to happen village by village, city by city, uh, and tribe by tribe. You have uh, in Anbar, the Bunimer tribe on one side and the Abu Asaf tribe on the other side. The, uh, you have the spiker, the, the, the victims of the spiker military camp who were, uh, who were killed. Uh, you have the Sunni, uh, you have Shia tribe saying actually it was Sunni tribes who killed uh, our sons, so we seek revenge. That, that is the level of complication that reconciliation has gotten to. But unfortunately, there isn't resources. That over, the situation is so overwhelming it is not taking traction to, to pay attention to those. Mm -hmm. I believe it is, it is fairly, well, fairly early to talk about reconciliation. Let's, let's look at who are those who are displaced. 90% of all the displaced are made up by four communities. Sunni Arabs. Half of all the displaced are Sunni Arabs. Sunni Arabs. Jazidis, Christians, and Turkmen Shia. If you were a pessimist, because the focus, the, the focus of hatred, of violence, of ISIL is very much on Jazidis and Christians. If you were a pessimist, you would say, if this continues a little bit longer, there won't be anybody to reconcile with left in the country. Which is really very sad if you look at it from a perspective of a historian. The first, some of the first Christian communities in the Middle East were established in what is today Iraq. And then, yeah, talking already by now about 
like legislation or longer term responses that would facilitate the process of reconciliation. Um, it's good, but again, I say it's perhaps a little bit premature. So we in IOM have recently started, thanks to generous funding from the United States of America government, with an activity that we call psychosocial support, which is a combination of capacity building, which is a combination of capacity building clinical assistance and other types of personalized follow-up and care activities focusing on the most traumatized parts of those who were forcibly displaced. And our main target populations are indeed representatives of the Jazidi and the Christian communities. So before talking about legislation and about longer term perspectives, we look at shorter term and immediate type of interventions that would have kind of a first hand healing type of effect. And it could, let's be optimistic also, then prepare the ground for some longer term reconciliation type of activity. That's a, that's a very good point, Dr. Weiss. I think you're right, and it goes back to the idea of on the individual level, uh, you really have to be able to address those needs. Viola? I can follow up on that, that. I mean, can you even think about national reconciliation when there's still an open question about whether there will be a nation? I mean, is, is, that, is that talk of Iraq dividing, has that subsided completely in the midst of this crisis, or is that still an open question? Yeah, that's what, what, yeah, that, that's what I try to say. Okay, there is no definition of what is reconciliation, reconciliation towards what. Uh, and so without that lack of, it's difficult to translate into action. So that's why a legislation alone is not enough. Uh, <coughs> working on trying to reconstitute life in those areas that will be liberated if people go back will be positive steps. But again, in the lack of a framework of, OK, where are we? Where do we want to go? Which is the exact question. What will this country look like uh, in, in practical terms? I think the efforts so far is, OK, let's fight this enemy that we have now. Uh, and then we will come to those fundamental questions. Uh, but this is where I think the Iraqi leadership and the international community will be missing an opportunity uh, because the pain you feel now uh, could uh, distract you uh, from the, the, the reason why you got there. Uh, and unless you think now for international community focus on the political track that got the country into this, what is, it was the shape of the government, the powers, the authorities, the, 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 who rules what, who controls what. If, if those are not part of the discussion, uh, then you don't know what to discuss and agree on and reconcile about. Uh, and that is not happening. And uh, the fight is overwhelming. The humanitarian situation is overwhelming. It's taking the attention away from that real fundamental question. And this is what the international community will do the Iraqis a great favor if it keeps hammering that question and stays with it uh, as they, they sort out these issues. And I would just add that if you're not having those conversations, even if you do talk about a divided Iraq, which again, there's not so much appetite because of, of what was described, um, you still have the problem of potential conflict of neighboring. Um, and so that's where that process is so essential. It's not a simple divide. It really is about finding out how the, they'll be able to work with one another, decentralization. Um, but I think the most important thing is in the last six months, we've seen that that national dialogue process isn't what Iraq needs. It really is the village to village and the psycho, <coughs> you know, individual to individual to move beyond the trauma and to move beyond um, the revenge. <coughs> Uh, I'm going to just turn to um, the speakers because I want to leave some time for interaction, maybe one-on-one -on -one versus just the panels, just for final wrap-up. Any final comments? Um, yeah, one, one final lead? comment about the conciliation. I think uh, it's not anymore, or the priority is not in the short term to work on these fancy national conferences where leaders convene. It's more to, to start working on, on reversing the consequences of what has happened and what is still happening, actually. Uh, over the last few years and and this is where working at individual level is very relevant as was pointed by Dr. Ways working at grassroots level as pointed by Sarhang village to village or tribe to tribe or house to house is also important so it's not the national reconciliation and the conventional form that we that we know it but it, it at least this kind of effort will lay the ground 
for the day when uh, the different constituents of Iraq will decide to rediscuss the political system and their administrative system and agree on something they would like to live under. So, but uh, with these con under these conditions, there's no way any political discussion can go further. Thank you, Eli. I actually have one adjustment. There's one more question, and then I'll go to the panelists to answer in final remarks. So I have a question going back to Sarah and your comment about the, the local leaders and how they're now in a position where they can claim legitimacy for liberating the areas that they're living in. And I mean, you talked about getting ahead of that control before the provincial elections. Um, we, we know that the, a lot of the players at the national level have changed. Some of the faces are the same under this new inclusive umbrella. Are, at the provincial level, are those leaders who are taking responsibility for liberating those areas the same that we would have seen a few years ago in the political scene and in the political environment as running for these provincial council elections, elections as being the ones involved in the process of these budget allocations and the actual uh, state running of those areas? Or are these also new players that, were com that are coming in freshly with a different sort of banner and history of taking care? of those areas? Um, I think uh, there's a combination, and it depends on, we, we, uh, and it varies from one area to another. If we are looking uh, at, the, at the Sunni areas, uh, you have the, 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 the known uh, leaders who, uh, still in government, Osama uh, uh, al-Najafi, Athir al-Najafi, you have um, uh, others in, in it, like um, Saleh al mutlaq but those do not have access to the ground now. Those, if there are other leaders who did not participate in the elections, uh, and because they were, they, they either did not believe in the political process, or they were eliminated through the debatification, or the justice and accountability uh, question, not qualifying uh, for uh, for elections, are they, they are these are the people who are holding the guns. And if you get into any settlement, uh, you will need to bring those into the fold of of, of somehow uh, and. That is, these people will come with legitimacy telling their people we resisted, this, we gained ground, and the, uh, they go in a certain direction. In the, uh, on the Shia side, uh, you have uh, new militias or new fighters, uh, new forces who were not uh, there before that have ri risen in uh, today. So uh, by, by 2010 or 11, uh, probably, so the political process brought most of the uh, that the armed Shia uh, forces into the government. Uh, even bad organization uh, started to become a political uh, party from being the, uh, the armed wing of, uh, of uh, ISKI. Um, but now you have more forces who were not, uh, either who were at the time junior uh, players in those forces who did not quite accept the political route uh, and they have formed their own thing, uh, or they have just now uh, revived. So, uh, uh, Muqtad al-Sadr has created Sarai Salam again because he is among peers who who needs claws to 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 survive, and that is he sees the next the next stage. So there is a combination of old and new. Uh, but those who were on the political moderate route, uh, it will be the time. The trend so far is not great, uh, but uh, unless serious work is done uh, and development <coughs> could, that 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 could change. Uh, and not in a good way, unfortunately. And the, the military development is still very much open. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the kind of tactics and attacks that, uh, what, that is possible, one, big, one thing like the Samara or the Hawija uh, could spark a major event that could lead to this uh, collapse. So uh, it, 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 it's really a mixed situation. Dr. Weiss, any final comments or response? Yeah, uh, more of a final comment than a direct response to the last question. Um, there is lots of competition around. Competition for, by definition, scarcely available funds. In the United Nations, IOM, we are part of the de facto United Nations family. We categorize emergencies uh, in three different levels, levels of gravity that would then entail levels of or mechanisms of response, L1, L2, L3. L3 is, is the worst case scenario and at the present moment 
we are working, we as the humanitarian community, simultaneously on five L3 emergencies, Iraq, Syria, South Sudan, Chad, and West Africa affected by Ebola. So when donors ask us, which area do you prioritize? As a humanitarian organization, the response is always, we prioritize the well-being of affected populations. So we cannot say you should give more money to Iraq than to Ebola affected West Africa. So there's lots of competition around. And in spite of the fact that Iraq is a middle-income country, as Sahang uh, impressively demonstrated, the, the declining price of the barrel is not really helping at all. So at the end of the day, um, this, this famous issue that we often talk about in Germany of the tree or the forest. Sometimes you don't see the forest because there are too many trees. We have to see, and we, I mean the international community, that there is a need for longer term, sustainable, and predictable interventions. Predictable from a financing, from a, a resource mobilization point of view in order to be able to really support and assist Iraq in order to recreate a situation that would be sustainable, that would be um, representing an improvement for the daily lives of the peoples. So as humanitarians, to wind it all up, we see uh, the process of, let's call it healing, the process of healing in Iraq in three different steps but three different steps that uh, in an ideal world would all be rolled out at the same time. First step or immediate short term, saving lives, continue to save lives. Through the different interventions of all the humanitarian players uh, and first and foremost the, the United Nations country team. Then midterm, if you look at social cohesion, at livelihoods, at the recreation of an environment that would enable people to stay where they are and to recreate their own lives. And then longer term, or if you want extended midterm, is then, as Dr. Eli mentioned, education and development. Um, as humanitarians, we cannot fix it all. And as my colleague Lado uh, would always say, uh, we can especially not fix the situation with the jerry can and the mattresses that we distribute to beneficiaries. So there has to be a holistic, an approach that sees the forest rather than the individual trees rolled out by all the players sitting around the table. And that's why my second point, you recall, partnerships is so very, very important. And you in the US, you as the United States Institute of Peace, you are part and parcel, an element and an important player of this partnership. And therefore, I thank you very much for the, the attention that you have uh, given to to us and to Iraq through this, uh, this round table. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Weiss. Um, it's not very round. I, huh? I'm saying the table is not very round. <laughs> 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 Thank you for your final comments. Oh, yes. Very quickly, very, brief. very quickly, very briefly. I think there is, uh, I, I'm not sure of that before, but there is a sign of hope. For me, it was very inspiring The many people that came to see us uh, uh, from very dangerous areas. So in the Iraqi politics, the tribes, many people cite as a constant that over, over the years and decades have been a, a, a player uh, for stabilization. Since 2003, the international community invested in civil society. I think this is the second uh, factor in Iraq uh, as, a, as a factor for uh, stability. That, and they are partner, good partners for us to, uh, to work with them, and they need help. Uh, they have been displaced, yet they <coughs> left their families and came to meetings and they were discussing a future for this country. Uh, I think before everybody was saying Iraq is a rich country and it should use its own resources, but with the, the barrel uh, oil at that at the 40 plus dollar, that, is, that statement is difficult to, to be true. Therefore, the international community needs to help Iraqi civil society rise on its feet again, to regroup, rise on its feet, and engage with it as a partner uh, the Iraqi government will not spend on that. The regional actors will not spend on that. This is where the United States, the, the Europe, the UN, and others uh, have this responsibility to help. And people in this room uh, can, can contribute to that. 
Thank you, and I want to thank you, Dr. Weiss and IOM. Like I said, we did an event about a year and a half ago. It was one of our best events. It really helped us. It gives us a lot of insight, as did this. So thank you very much for your time. Um, and you know, please, there's a, a little bit of time um, if you want to have some <coughs> conversations. We invite you to speak with the panelists. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you.